Hi everybody, today's video is going to be covering chapter 20 of Living in the Environment, which will talk about water pollution. Uh, water pollution is defined as any change in water quality that can harm living organisms or otherwise make water um, unusable for human uses. Um, so this would cover both environmental hazards and um, human health hazards. Um, and the first thing you want to know about water pollution is its sources, and its sources come in two forms. They could be point sources, such as the outflow from a specific factory or waste treatment facility. They can be non-point sources, which cover large areas such as animal feedlots or um, suburban uh, home development areas. and these pollutants are going to be classified into several different categories. They can be chemical in nature, they could be biological in nature, um, and they can be physical in nature. And we'll talk about these in class, but there's a really easy chart to reference in your textbook that classifies uh, the type of water pollutant gives some examples of what we mean when we talk about that specific water pollutant and then also highlights major sources. So you're going to want to know about specific infectious agents. These could be pathogens due to bacteria, viruses, parasites, um, something like a protozoan or other um, single-celled organism that might be causing problems in the water. And they tend to cause diseases in areas where we don't see proper drinking water treatment. Uh, these infectious agents can be quite serious and lead to harmful effects. This, you know, basically no access to clean drinking water is one of the most telling um, reasons why we see uh, low in high infant mortality rates in low income or um, less developed nations. Oxygen demanding wastes are going to be sort of uh, animal waste, plate, plant debris, anything that's being broken down or degrading in the environment due to enzymes or bacteria that are present in the environment. So this material would come from sewage, uh, feedlots, waste from food processing facilities, etc. And the organisms that break down this material have a high oxygen demand. And so that's why we refer to these things as oxygen demanding wastes. Uh, plant nutrients we've talked about in the past and measured as well, uh, nitrates and phosphates, for example, are going to come from uh, fertilizer runoff. We also see them in wastes and in sewage. Um, and those things can cause cultural eutrophication in uh, standing water bodies or in coastal uh, marine systems. A uh, number of organic-based chemicals um, are going to basically play the role of certain toxins in the environment. These include um, petrochemical-based materials, which are in fact hydrocarbons and are organic in nature. So plastics, oils, gasolines, pesticides, etc., cetera, uh, are all gonna be considered organic chemicals and they can come from industry, they can come from households, they can come from farms. We see them in a variety of sources. Uh, we see lots of inorganic chemicals, acids, bases, salts, heavy metals, etc. Many of those come from industry, but some can come from households, uh, surface runoff, etc. cetera. Um, we've certainly talked about those things coming from uh, mining practices around the world as well. Sediment would disrupt the turbidity of a water system, um, and we could see those as soils and silts and other um, clouding agents from erosion. Uh, obviously, heavy metals, lead, mercury, arsenic, etc., are going to enter the water system, and these are problematic to the body both of animals and of people because they you know, interrupt endocrine function, they disrupt the immune system, they can have effects on the nervous system, they can cause cancers. And we also add some physical elements here, thermal, uh, basically heat pollution is um, found often during um, the cooling process in industrial and electrical power generating plants. 
And then one I would add here that's not actually on the list is acoustic pollution or um, sound pollution. I have a friend who researches acoustic communication on um, uh, marine animals. And often, you know, you might go straight to, oh, yes, like whales and dolphins need to be able to communicate with sound across long, long distances. But her research actually looks at smaller organisms that are uh, benthic in nature, like um, stomatopods or other crustaceans and sound pollution from things like sonar or um, the uh, sound of industry nearby or the sound of boats and shipping um, lanes, all of these things can disrupt the ability for marine organisms to communicate. So I would add noise pollution or sound pollution on this list as well. In terms of the infectious diseases, um, the World Health Organization reports that on the order of 2 million people or more die every year from uh, diarrhea-related causes, and most of those are induced by some sort of pathogen that is exposed to them in their drinking water or is exposed to them in water that's been used to wash their food. Uh, and these can include bacteria, cholera, for example, dysentery. These are things that people often hear about, and we, we've known of outbreaks of these um, conditions uh, around the world. Um, type B hepatitis uh, is viral, and that can um, be contaminated, uh, be transmitted through contaminated drinking water. Um, Giardia is one of the uh, big ones to watch out for, as well as other parasites um, that can get into the body and cause issues over time. So how do we know if our water is contaminated or not? Uh, we test for pollutants. We know that measuring water quality means testing things like pH, turbidity, temperature, and you know many other sort of abiotic factors. But we also need to add to those tests um, the measurement of biotic factors that could be in our water. So we have chemical tests for inorganic material, chemical tests for organics material, so we can tell if there's you know plastics or oils or something in the water. We're going to measure um, fecal form uh, bacteria, which usually includes E. coli, uh, but can include some other types of bacteria. Uh, we're going to have to look for oxygen demanding wastes that are coming from, uh, you know, organic sources that are being broken down over time because that's uh, a big indicator of what the dissolved oxygen actually looks like in a system. We can use chemical tests to measure nitrates and phosphates. Etc. And we can also use indicator species, uh, biodiversity assays, to see, you know, what species are actually living in this system, what species are tolerant enough to survive living in a particular system if it is exposed to pollutants. Salt oxygen is probably the most important uh, water quality test that will tell us if the water is livable for other organisms, including phytoplankton, including plankton and um, fish and, you know, larger organisms throughout the food chain. And, you know, good dissolved oxygen is going to be around 8 to 9 uh, ppm. Um, the amount of oxygen that can dissolve into the water changes with temperature. So the warmer the water, the less dissolved oxygen. The colder the water, the more dissolved oxygen is going to be able to enter into that water. However, we're seeing regions around the world that are hypoxic. In other words, they experience periods of low uh, dissolved oxygen, or even regions that are becoming permanently anoxic. Basically, there's no dissolved oxygen in those regions, and um, they've been considered to be heavily or gravely polluted. So any level below basically 5 ppm is going to be dangerous for most respiring organisms. In moving systems in a lake, uh, sorry, in a stream or a river, um, those systems can recover more easily from uh, the exposure to some sort of oxygen demanding waste. Basically, in this image, we're seeing a stream or a river where a single point source is bringing in uh, some sort of oxygen demanding waste. Again, this could be runoff from a feedlot, this could be um, excess uh, material from um, a sewage pipe. This could be 
leaf litter that's biodegrading. There's a lot of possible sources from uh, these materials. But essentially what happens is here we have healthy dissolved oxygen levels. Um, but where those oxygen demanding wastes enter into the system, we see the oxygen sag, uh, where it will actually become uh, very dangerously low. We refer to sort of the region where we see decomposition start to happen as the decomposition zone. But when decomposition has happened, and there's no more oxygen in the water for more decomp to continue, uh, we refer to that as the septic zone. Because these systems are moving and flowing and we're bringing in new water, there is a zone of recovery. Um, and then we return to a clean zone and our dissolved oxygen goes up. Uh, one way we measure this is by biological oxygen demand. We call this BOD, this is an important term to know. But essentially the BOD here is low because there's not that many wastes to be broken down by decomposition bacteria. Uh, but when that bacteria meets these wastes that are coming off of the land, they immediately start to break them down. They immediately respire. And as they respire, they're going to use up all of that oxygen. And so we see um, that these bacteria are going to rapidly deplete dissolved oxygen. And this could eliminate or at least reduce other populations that are relying on that dissolved oxygen. And sometimes we'll see these associated with fish kills. We can use indicator species such as those shown here uh, to tell us the quality of the water. And if the fish are absent, if we see mostly anaerobic bacteria, if we don't see a lot of invertebrates, we're able to say, okay, this is an area of a septic zone. This is low dissolved oxygen. These are um, organisms that either don't need a lot of oxygen or can't survive um, or won't survive with that versus some of the fishes. Um, these mayfly and stonefly larvae are really, really sensitive to low oxygen environments. Um, and those are good indicator species of the health of a river or a stream. Uh, the recovery of rivers and streams depends on, again, the volume of the waste that's actually coming in. Um, versus the stream's volume. So are we overloading our stream or not? And the flow rate of the stream or river, the temperature of the stream or river, and the pH of the stream or river are going to have a great effect on how much dissolved oxygen is actually present. Uh, we know that um, in the United States, this was a huge issue for us throughout the 20th century. We have passed laws and regulations to be able to regulate um, wild uh, systems, but not all countries have done that. Some are um, still working on reducing point source pollution, but non-point sources tend to be the most difficult for uh, governments or um, municipalities to pinpoint and uh, monitor. And uh, not every place is able to properly treat their sewage. Um, industrial wastes are also a big problem in a lot of places. Uh, your, your textbook highlights uh, the Ganges River in India, uh, where uh, both, you know, culturally it is used um, and manufacturing and industry it is used and agriculturally it is used. Um, and the population is just so high that really that river is completely overloaded. And no matter what its volume, flow rate, temperature, pH, etc., um, it's being inundated and overrun with the amount of um, oxygen demanding wastes. In areas that have less flow um, or uh, limited vertical mixing, um, the flushing out or the, the replenishment or the recovery is going to be really hard. Um, and so eutrophication happens when these oxygen demanding wastes enter into more stagnant waters um, and the oxygen demand goes up, the oxygen availability goes down, but with enough time or uh, throughout different seasonal changes, these things can turn over or uh, be fixed. Cultural eutrophication is a term that refers to when urban or agricultural areas nearby overload the nutrient um, uh, amount basically in these systems, uh, cause them to go through huge periods of 
um, blooms, algal blooms usually, where the nutrients immediately give rise to many, many, many different organisms at the surface that are using the sun um, to grow. But that tends to block out solar access to lower levels and can result in, you know, the unmixed lower areas, you know, deeper areas, not turning over and becoming permanently anoxic. Um, and so we're seeing lots of eutrophication here in the United States, especially in areas where nitrates and phosphates are in the effluents that are entering these rivers and ponds. Um, your textbook talks about pollution in the Great Lakes, uh, and so that's a really good case study to read over if you have the chance. Switching gears a little bit, groundwater contamination is also a problem. So we've talked about surface waters, but now let's look at groundwater. Um, and usually the problem with groundwater is the non-biodegradable contaminants. There's not usually a lot of organisms in groundwater that are oxygen demanding. Um, and the biological materials tend to get filtered out before the water enters the aquifers, uh, usually through percolation through the soil. But non-biodegradable contaminants uh, usually will pass right through, um, and these things can get into our groundwater systems. <clears throat> so some of them are going to be organic-based, um, and they contaminate about 45% of municipal groundwater supplies. These can be um, sourced through tanks that store gasoline, store diesel fuel, uh, store heating oil underground. These can be solvents that come from industrial plants. Uh, and once they enter into an aquifer, it can take hundreds or thousands of years for that aquifer to cleanse itself. Um, and that's only of degradable wastes. The, the undegradable ones are going to enter the system and probably stay there permanently unless somehow they are pumped and cleaned out um, through man-made processes. And so take a look at this image, you know, see some of the sources, how, how we see materials going down into the aquifer system, and then where we see wells pumping water up, um, they potentially could be pumping up contaminated water. We um, see non-degradable wastes building up over time after so many years of human activities. Lead, arsenic, fluoride are going to basically stay there permanently unless some sort of other solution is um, entered. Uh, larger organic materials like DDT or PCBs are going to be really slow to degrade and those tend to stay um, in these systems. The case study highlighted in your text is arsenic. Um, which uh, is found uh, in some of the main aquifers. We tend to see it more higher concentrations here in the Western United States. Um, but, you know, arsenic is a concern. This would be um, something that drinking water people would test for uh, before they allow a water source to be used for drinking water. Um, and you know, around the world, we see arsenic levels um, as high as five to 100 times the set standard, which is 10 parts per billion. Um, so that's a big issue. So we know it takes many, many years <laughs> for degradable waste to be removed. Non-degradable non waste are pretty much there permanently. And so what our solutions are is maybe to prevent these substances from entering groundwater by looking at leak detectors and underground tanks, um, by banning the disposal of hazardous wastes underground, um, and then clean up. You know, how do we pump this liquid to the surface and refine it or um, decontaminate it? In some cases, we could inject microorganisms into that water to help it clean up. Um, and in some cases, we are seeing um, pump systems that are designed to remove these small inorganic compounds. This is research that is still undergoing and it's very expensive to um, clean an aquifer from a non-degradable waste that has entered into the system. So drinking water is a big concern. Centralized water treatment plants and watershed protection provide safe drinking water for um, 
municipal, large scale municipal, so large towns and cities. Um, some people will still rely on a well system, individual well system, especially in more rural areas. For less developed countries, there's some pretty quick inexpensive solutions to be able to treat drinking water before you drink it. Um, UV radiation will kill a number of infectious microbes, so people are encouraged to draw water up and then allow it to sit out and be exposed to the sun to kill off microbes. Uh, we're seeing success in some of these areas by um, providing life straws or providing something like a pure power, a powder, which through um, uh, chlorine and iron sulfate can decontaminate the water. Uh, the U.S. Safe Drinking Water Act requires the EPA to establish national s contaminant standards uh, for any pollutant that might have an adverse health effect. But despite this, we still here in the United States have entire communities, Flint, Michigan probably being the most famous, um, that are exceeding those contaminant levels regularly, and people are still um, exposed to these materials in their drinking water. Uh, we'll talk about the Clean Air, Clean Water Act in a little bit more detail, but essentially, you know, millions of Americans still drink water that's below EPA standards. Um, the Clean Water Act, originally passed in 1972, has been revised several times, um, and it regulates mostly only point source pollution. Um, you cannot discharge pollutants into surface waters without a permanent from the United States government, but non-point sources are not regulated by this act. And so drinking water is still contaminated, um, surface waters are still contaminated, groundwater is still contaminated um, by non-point sources. Um, and we see violations of the Clean Water Act happening all the time. And the EPA you know, has to keep up with finding those people um, or you know, so somehow otherwise enforcing these clean water standards. Um, ocean pollution is a big deal. 40% uh, of the population in the world lives near the coast and um, we see estuaries that are threatened. We see coastal waters that are threatened. Um, if you have too much eutrophication, uh, we tend to see harmful algal blooms. This is a picture of one up here at the top where we can actually see the front of a harmful algal bloom when this is all algae that has bloomed and is basically using up all of the material that it, it found, whether it's nitrogen, phosphorus, or some other oxygen demanding waste. Um, and this is going to lead to oxygen depletion zones and fish kills. We see large scale dead zones in areas where the effluent from on land is bringing lots of that material off of non-point sources throughout sort of the breadbasket of the United States here in you know the Midwest and the in the um, uh, in the valleys and the plains, um, and you know areas like the Gulf of Mexico are basically starting to be labeled dead zones where there is so much oxygen demand on the system that there's basically no oxygen available. Um, take a look at this image, which talks about some of the sources for ocean pollution uh, and shows both uh, red tides at the surface or harmful algal blooms at the surface, leading to oxygen depleted zones at depth, uh, which can result in you know, fish kills, etc. Um, toxins can get into marine sediments and stay there for a very long time. And sort of all of this runoff from the nearby urban community or the nearby coastal community is going to cause big issues for the oceans. One of those is oil spills. Um, we know that most of this oil pollution um, is coming from spills or leaks that are associated with drilling or transport of oil. Um, tanker accidents, for example, blowouts from drills um, can be extremely devastating. And we're going to look at um, the Deepwater Horizon spill, which is now 11 years ago, um, in more detail in class. Plastics are the other major issue that we're thinking about when we think about oceans. 
Um, they predicted that these garbage patches would form if we didn't slow down our use of disposables. Um, and we've been tracking sort of gigantic, slowly rotating masses of plastics in our oceans um, for uh, you know, 20 years, almost 30 years. And all five ocean gyres are going to be associated with floating plastics. The North Pacific garbage patch is probably the most famous um, and certainly the largest. It's been measured to basically span, you know, as wide as the state of Texas, I think, is sort of the, the common statistic that's given. Um, the problem with the plastics is that they make up most of the disposable waste that we use and they don't biodegrade. Um, they will break down into smaller pieces and create microplastics, but they don't actually change chemical form because no organisms or very few organisms produce enzymes that can actually break them down at the molecular level. Um, and these microplastics contain PCBs, DDTs, BPAs, sort of all of these toxins that we've talked about in the past. They become ingested by smaller organisms like plankton and fish, and then bioaccumulated up through um, uh, basically the tissues of larger fishes and other organisms. And you know, today we're starting to see that you know, the fish that we catch in wild caught fisheries contain plastics. We're starting to find plastics falling with our microplastics, very, very small plastics falling with our snow and rain um, because they're entered into our hydrologic system and we can't get them out. Um, and so this is a major issue to watch over the next 50 years. Um, when we talk about solutions, especially coastal water solutions, we want to be really careful about sewage at coastal regions. Um, and we want to really be careful with the transport and the drilling of oil. So these are things that, you know, we're really concerned about. Um, we need to reduce erosion and fertilizer runoff by making sure our cropland is always covered um, or uses some sort of, you know, conservative tilling methods. Um, the best plan is to use less fertilizer, and so we're trying to discourage fertilizers from being used on steep, steeply sloped lands um, and shifting to more sustainable food production methods and planting a, some sort of buffer zone at the edge of these regions, which can um, hold or contain some of those uh, pollutants before they enter into nearby surface waters. Um, you should make yourself familiar with a lot of the laws um, that are basically established to set water pollution standards. Obviously, the Clean Drinking Water Act, I'm sorry, the Clean Water Act, which started as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1972, um, was renamed the Clean Water Act in 77. And basically, they found that lakes, rivers, and coastal waters were so unfit um, that we really needed to make them safe. And, Overall, we've seen at least point sources um, complying with this and reducing the amount of water pollution that we see. Other acts like the Marine Protection Research um, and Sanctuaries Act um, empower the EPA to regulate the dumping of untreated sewage and toxic chemicals into U.S. water. Uh, your drinking water is protected by the U.S. Safe Drinking Water Act. Toxic Substance Control Act, we'll talk a little bit about in this chapter, but also in the next chapter. Uh, CERCLA we'll talk about more in the next chapter as well. Um, yeah, so just sort of make yourself familiar with these policies and how they've contributed to the cleanup. Um, you know, two of the biggest things that you're going to need to know are how we uh, treat our sewage, better septic tanks, um, uh, and other sewage treatments can reduce point source water pollution. So about a quarter of the homes in the United States aren't on municipal sewage, and in fact, they um, have their own individual septic system. There's pretty limited regulation on these after they're installed. You would probably notice if you had a big leak in your septic system, but small leaks and small cracks are gonna go mostly unnoticed and can contaminate nearby groundwater. So the way this works is you you know, flush your toilet, and the waste is going to enter into what we call a septic tank. That material, as it comes through, 
will, um, you know, the, the heavier material will go to the bottom where it basically gets broken down by anaerobic bacteria. Um, gas will float to the top from the decomposition that's going on um, and usually off gas into the air around you. Um, the water from that, once it's been, you know, th sitting in the septic tank long enough, will enter into what we call a drainage field or a leach field, uh, where it is distributed basically throughout your lawn, if you have one, essentially, um, and then enters into a drain field that's gravel or, or stone that helps to filter it out even further. And there's small vent pipes which allow gases to continue to leave. Um, so it's basically a sewage treatment happening in your own backyard. Um, if you're living in a municipal place, and so this would be applicable to he us here in the Bay Area, uh, the raw sewage needs to be treated at a plant. Um, and there's two steps to this. There's primary treatment and there's secondary treatment. Um, in primary treatment, the raw sewage enters um, and is going to go through a series of bar screens. These screens are going to hold back really large debris. So if you have plastics, if you have, um, uh, you know, big pieces of municipal waste that have somehow washed into your septic system, into your sewage system, those are going to get screened out. The rest of the material enters what we call a grit chamber, and we use density to um, remove any large floating objects and allow the rest of the material to settle um, and settle some more in the sludge tank or the settling tank. Um, once the big pieces have sort of settled physically out of the system, then we put that water through a series of secondary treatments uh, that allow aeration and use biological processes using aerobic bacteria to break down those oxygen demanding wastes. Um, as much as 90% of the dissolved biodegradable material um, will be broken down, <laughs> which is pretty helpful. Uh, then it enters another settling system um, to get rid of, again, any excess particulates that have been left over. Um, and then it goes on to maybe an advanced treatment like uh, disinfection, uh, UV exposure, et cetera, to kill basically anything that's remaining. Um, and before it enters back into a natural system, they have to test it and treat it to make sure that all of these materials are removed. Um, Sewage waste is a great invention. It's a, it's a really impressive technology. We're getting better and better at it, but it does come with side effects that, um, again, can still contaminate groundwater. Uh, if you have overrun of the system, <clears throat> if for some reason <clears throat> your system can't treat um, all of the water that you've got coming through, um, that excess sewage can enter into the system. Um, some people report odors um, when they live in proximity to sewage treatment systems, etc. So, um, you know, think about sort of the side effects to uh, these really important processes. And we'll study this in a lot more detail um, in this unit as well.